So, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm here today to tell you about something quite important. Uh, when you think uh, of a membrane, especially a biological membrane, um, that surrounds a cell. And don't forget that the role of a membrane is actually to keep whatever is outside, whatever, the, whatever is dissolved in the water outside of the cell, to keep it separate from what's dissolved inside of that cell, right? So when you think of a bacteria or of any other cell, you need to remember that what's outside doesn't need to be what's inside. There's a difference, and those differences are sometimes very, very important. So the cell will work very, very hard to keep things separate so that the biological processes getting in, uh, going on inside the cell, there's no interference by whatever is outside the cell. So that involves that sometimes um, the cell will need to import things from the outside or make sure that some molecules get uh, from the inside out. So for example, you can think of any waste products from biochemical processes. Um, some of the molecules that are being used by the bacteria, there's always waste that accumulates in some way. And that waste will, that waste will need to eventually make its way out of the cell so that the cell does not poison itself. On the other side, you can imagine that some nutrients outside of that cell, whatever that molecule the nutrient is, um, has to make its way in in some way or another. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is, uh, is the processes through which um, molecules get um, imported or, uh, or exported in some way or another. So we're going to talk about diffusion versus transport. And we'll see there's fun fundamental uh, differences between uh, those two terms, okay? So when you think of any cell, uh, you need to remember that there is um, a, a, a membrane, right? And that membrane is made with a molecule, a very simple molecule. But actually not that simple, but um, it's a simple unit, is that it has a, a polar head with, with two hydrophobic tails, right? So those molecules most of the time are called or phospholipids because they are that kind of molecule. And you can imagine that throughout this membrane all of those phospholipids are you know throughout the membrane. So you can imagine a long plane of uh, these phospholipids all around surrounding all, all around the cell. Um, so let's imagine that this is the outside of the cell and that's the inside of that cell. So like I said earlier there's water that is um, present in, in and out of that cell and, um, and whatever is dissolved in that water does not need to be the same uh, and shouldn't actually shouldn't be the same. So there's a need to bring molecules in and out of that cell and this is what we're going to look at today. So the first thing that uh, I wanted to let you know is that when you think of a biological membrane, that biological, biological membrane um, has very specific properties is that the inside of that membrane where the phospholipids are, the tails of the phospholipids are, is highly hydrophobic. So what that means is that water does not interact very well with that portion right here. But since there's water inside and outside of that cell, that water, those water molecules, um, we could represent them like this, right? We can represent them like the oxygen here and then the hydrogen, so that's why we have H2O. And these, these molecules of water are interacting very well with the polar heads. Um, there's no problem there. It, water interacts pretty well with this. But when it, need, when it gets to interacting with the inside of that, that membrane, that doesn't go so well. And anything that is dissolved in that water in and out might or not interact with the inside of that membrane. So therefore, we need transportation systems for that. The first, in the simplest way, for molecules to make their way in or out of the cell is through simple diffusion. And some molecules have the, the physical, and physical and chemical properties that allow them to interact with the inside of that membrane there. And I'm not going to get into the details of this. This is above what we, we need to know for now. But, you know, just accept that some molecules actually can make their way in and out without any problems at all. So some gases can actually do that in other molecules as well. So um, what you, we need to do to know here is that there's a process called simple, simple diffusion. And that simple diffusion is, is, 
is very simple. <laughs> uh, no pun intended here. Um, what happens here is that when we have a gradient of molecule, when we have one side and then uh, of, of, you know, it can be anything, one side of the membrane, and then we have so many molecules on that side, these molecules, if they can go through the membrane and interact with the hydrophobic core of that membrane, these molecules will make their way inside or out and they will do so in um, a gradient fashion. So what that means is that the high concentration of molecule, so those molecules will move from the high concentration to the low concentration of, of um, that membrane, right? So it follows that gradient. It goes, we say that it goes down the gradient. Um, just imagine this, this is an example, right? Just imagine that you do have a beaker, right? And in that beaker, you have water, right? So this, this is our beaker right here, right? And we're gradients and all that. And uh, we have water that, that's in here. So a little bit of water, you know, here and there, little bubbles here. And then imagine that in that beaker, you have a, you know, with a pipette or something, you uh, with a dropper, you have this little dropper here, and then you make sure that there's like a blue dye that falls into that water here. You know what's going to happen, right? you know that this dye here is going to diffuse over time, especially if it's stirred. But you don't even need to stir it. You know that this dye will diffuse all over the beaker and giving that little tint of blue after it's gone. Anybody here has ever seen the opposite? Have you ever seen all the dye dissolved in water coming back to a little single dot, right? Nobody has seen that. That's never going to happen. For this to happen would demand a huge amount of energy to concentrate everything. It's like it's worse than herding cats, right? You need to bring all the molecules together. That's never going to happen. Here's why. The molecule, the, the, the drop here has a high concentration of molecules, and these molecules will move out to a place where there's less energy. So uh, there's more energy in the drop than there is when it's diffused. And this is what the laws of thermodynamics are telling us, is that the universe is going from an organized state to a more and more and more disorganized state. And that is just thermodynamics. There's not much we can do about that. If you wanted to bring everything back, you would need to spend a huge amount of energy, right? And, and that's not possible. So now coming back to our membrane, um, when you have molecules that can cross a membrane, one way or the other, right? Either in or out, to out or out to in. Um, if these molecules can interact with the, the hydrophobic core of the membrane, they will move, but they always move down a gradient, which means that they will follow the high concentration to the low concentration. So in this case here, like I said, we have a high concentration of whatever molecule it is on the outside of the cell. And if it can make it way in, it will, and it will follow that gradient until there is an equilibrium until there's as much concentration on the outside and there is on the inside. Just, you might not see the movement at the microscopic level, so you wouldn't see the molecules, those won't see that your color change, but if you could look at it at the molecular level, you would see that as one molecule comes in, another molecule comes out, right? That's equilibrium. But it moves only because there is um, equilibrium now, but it will never go back to a high concentration, right? So that's simple diffusion. It just goes from what? So remember the beaker, the, the blue dye moving out of, of the, 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 the drop and occupying all the space. Now, this is good for molecules that I can actually have the capacity to cross that membrane, right? It's, it's a very special type of molecule that can do that. And Honestly, you don't want all molecules to be able to do that because it would not be viable, right? You don't want all molecules outside of your cells to get in. Not everything that's in your blood is actually something you want in your cells, right? So in order to, to select what comes in and what comes out, sometimes the cell will have specialized molecules embedded in that membrane, and those molecules will be proteins, or we can call them channels, right? So those channels... So let's draw a channel right here. So just imagine that there's our membrane right here with all the phospholipids. I'm not going to draw every single one of them. But imagine that we have a protein right here 
and a protein right there. So that's just seen from the side, right? It's a cut, right? If you could bring this membrane here and look at it like that, you would actually see something like that, right? So that's the lumen of that channel right here, right? That's the lumen right there. And what you see here is just like a cut of the protein. So we're seeing this from the side here, and this is what we're looking at right now, right? So having said that, some of the channels are adapted to certain types of molecules. So when you have an opening like that, um, some channels will allow water, so they're called aqua channels or aquaporins, and water could go back and forth between those channels, right? It's important for a cell to regulate the amount of water in and out. Um, but sometimes there's other molecules as well that can make their way in or their way out, and the, these molecules, some of them are being selected by the type of, of um, channel they will interact with. So in this case, if we have a channel that regulates the in and out, so uh, regulates the kind of molecule that goes in and out, but if that channel allows movement only from high concentration to the lower concentration, that is still called diffusion. Okay? Diffusion is the movement of something from one concentration, a high concentration, to a low concentration. We just looked at the simple diffusion. Now what we're looking at is diffusion through a, a, a door, if we can say it like that. So that door is actually a, a, a protein. And that's called facilitated diffusion, right? Facilitated diffusion. And what it says is that there's just one molecule that allows, that it facilitates the movement. Without this molecule, these mo without this protein here, without this channel, the ions or whatever is on the outside might not make their way in or their way out, right? We need these specialized. Why is that? Because the membrane does not allow these molecules, would not allow these molecules to make their way through, directly through the membrane. So, basically, what's common between facilitated diffusion and simple diffusion? Well, what's common is that it follows the gradient, right? It goes from high concentration to low concentration. The difference between the two of them is one does not interact with uh, the membrane, right? It doesn't go through the membrane. So it needs a door to get in or out of that cell. That's facilitated diffusion. So these are the similar similarities and differences of the two types of diffusion. Now, sometimes there comes um, a situation where the cell will need to either import or export something, but then go against the gradient of uh, the, the gradient. And so just imagine this, right? What we're asking the cell to do when you go against the gradient is actually the same thing as to bring it, you know, put a beaker and then put all the diet back to a single drop, right? That demands energy. And the cell cannot do that unless we have special mechanisms that allow such a thing to happen. And obviously, because this goes against the laws of thermodynamics, it go, doesn't go against nature. It goes against that law of thermodynamics. But actually, what you do is you say, well, I'm going to go against that, but I'm going to pay a price for it. And there's a price that the cell will pay. There's a currency that the cell will pay in order to do something like that. So now, let's see what this thing would look like, right? So we still have our membrane right here. And that membrane has proteins embedded in it, right? So that membrane is a fluid we say fluid mosaic model, and this membrane is made of phospholipids that are actually quite fluid, right? It really flows. I just think about, take maybe olive oil or something like that, right? So it's not solid like butter, right? It's not a, it's not a barrier like that. It's actually something that's quite fluid. And there's proteins here and there, and some of those proteins actually have um, specific functions. Some of them have to be channels, but some other ones are doors that rotate in one way but not in another. And that's what we're going to look at right now. So this is what we have here. We have, our, we have our membrane right here. And just imagine that we need to transport, um, I don't know, sodium. I'm just saying this could be anything else, right? But let's say that we have sodium outside. And that sodium concentration on the outside, so the concentration of the sodium ion is quite high, right? Let's not put any numbers to it. Let's just accept that this concentration is quite high. And the concentration of the sodium inside that cell, for a reason or another, I'm not saying why, um, is much smaller than 
you know, when you compare. So the, the concentration outside, concentration of sodium outside, so let's say O, is higher than the concentration of sodium on the inside of the cell, right? So this is what we have, the situation we have here. Remember we have this membrane there. Membrane is always there, right? Membrane always hacks uh, as a, uh, a way to prevent um, all molecules to go back and forth between the two spaces because we want to keep these unequal, right? We want to separate things inside from the outside. So we can imagine that we could have a protein that's embedded into that, that, um, that membrane. And let's draw that protein right here. So let's say that we have this protein here that's like kind of like that, right? And imagine that this protein has a function. So we call proteins that have a function and they actually have a function, they actually do a chemical change or chemical shift, if we can say it like that. And we say those molecules, those type of proteins are called enzymes. Um, so we have an enzyme here, type of protein that's embedded in the membrane. And this protein can rotate. So it can go from what? So just imagine when you go in a hotel, for example, you have those nasty rotating doors, right? And then we're never too sure. Right? We walk in a rotating door, we're afraid to go too fast, afraid to go too slow. Well, there's that rotating door. And if you don't know when to get out, well, you need to make your way back in, right? So just imagine that this is like some kind of rotating door. And let's imagine that our ion uh, sodium plus fits into that crease right here, right? So here's our sodium ion right there. And let's imagine that this, this molecule rotates to bring the sodium ion on the other side, right? So what it does is that it rotates this way, right? So it started here, now it's here inside the membrane and for some reason, and then at the end, the end result is that the sodium ion is now here, so plus, right, sodium ion is always positive, and then our sodium ion is now part, is now out of that cell, and then it can leave, right? So you think, well, oh, easy, right? We just have a protein that rotates, takes the, you know, sodium ion, pushes it out. Well, here's the problem. The problem is that in order to do this, because we accept it right off the bat, that in our case here, just for this teaching case, we accepted that the sodium outside of that cell, the concentration is much higher than what is found on the inside. We're going against a gradient. If we're going against a gradient, we're going to have to spend some energy. It goes against the laws of thermodynamics, right? So in that case here, in order to do this and let the sodium ion out, the cell will need to spend some kind of energy. And the currency that it's going to pay is called ATP. And I'm not going to get into the details of what ATP, why does it have energy, and all of that. Right? I mean, you know, we can spend a lot of time just talking about that, right? But what we need to know here is that in order to rotate this way and let the sodium ion out against the gradient, this system here will need to actually spend the currency. We'll need to spend the ATP, the energy, and transform it into some kind of ADP. And by transforming a phosphate, so that's adenosine triphosphate, so there's like adenosine here, and phosphate, 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 and then ADP is the same, but it has only two phosphates like that. Where is the third phosphate here? Well, this third phosphate is not transferred to that protein right there. It activates it in some way. The protein changes, because of that, changes shape, and then allows the sodium ion to go up. This is not diffusion. Because diffusion always goes with the gradient. It goes the highest concentration to the lowest concentration. In this case here, that's not the case, right? What we have here is active transport. And what it did, it went from a low concentration to a high concentration and let the sodium ion out. It's not just sodium. It happens with other types of ions, other types of molecules as well. And the cell will need to pay a lot of, of um, energy sometimes just to do these, to do these uh, types of activities. That's a very important thing for the cell to do. So now, what is common between facilitated diffusion and this one? Well, what's common is that both of them, facilitated diffusion, uses a transportation system, right? A channel in some way. Active transport, that's what it's called. I don't think I wrote that, but let's write it right now. Active 
transport. The active transport is, has some similarities with facilitated diffusion because it too uses a protein to achieve the transportation. Now, the difference between the two is that this system, this way of doing things, because we spend energy, we can go against the gradient. We can bring this dye that's all around, all you know, around our, our beaker, we can bring it back to that drop, right? Because we spend the energy for that. The cell has ways to do this. So that's the difference. Facility to diffusion does not need energy because it goes with the gradient. Active transport needs energy because it goes against that. It goes against the gradient, brings it back. All three of them, there's not one that's more important than the other. They're all very important. They're all ways that the cell uses to make sure that it stays at um, homeostasis, right? It stays at equilibrium and healthy. All of them are, are important, but all of them are very different. There's similarities between the three, three of them. There's also differences, and it's very important for you to know those. Similarities and differences. Thank you.